could I go? I'm seeking refuge for my soul. I'm needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I? Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? And all the time. Look at somebody near you this evening, afternoon and tell them good evening. Amen. Amen. It's so good to see all of those that have come out here on this evening for this final night of our family week, which has been a great week thus far. Um, we thank all of you that have come out as well as we thank those of you that have been watching us via live stream. And we have covered a couple different topics as we started um, on Sunday. Um, and we've been talking about honoring God in various places in the family talking about, you know, fighting for the family, how we need to take a stand for our family. And then Elder Coffee came these past two nights and did a wonderful job talking about honoring God in your home. And not just honoring God in your home, but honoring God in your marriage. So simply put, in every facet of your family life, God ought to be honored. God ought to be lifted up. God ought to be number one in every aspect of your life when it comes to your family and the relationships that you have. So on tonight, we're dealing with the subject of, of, of raising children to honor God. That, that's, the, that's the topic of discussion on tonight, raising children to honor God. But I wanna, want us to go as already read on tonight to Mark chapter 10, um, verse 13 through 16. And this passage of scripture is going to be, a, a, I say, a two for one um, because it's going to show us um, the, the attitude that Jesus had towards the children. And then Jesus turns around and lets them know, hey, the same spirit that the children has, if you want to make it to heaven, you need to have that same kind of spirit. So Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and he blessed them. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. I want to give for our topic on tonight simply, don't forget about the children. Don't forget about the children. Now, in the text that I've just read, in this passage of scripture that we have, Jesus has just finished teaching about a very serious matter about marriage and divorce. And as soon as that discussion was over, Jesus turns his attention to some little children that had been brought to him by their parents. Now, it was the tradition that they had in the Jewish culture to bring small children to the rabbis so that they could bless them or so they could pray for them. And it was also common for parents to take their children to the synagogue where the elders would do the same thing. They would pray for their children. They would lay their hands on their children. And, but these parents this day, they were severely rebuked by the Lord's disciples. And I mean, just a little filter right there. You would think that if anybody would want people to bring their children to Jesus, it would have been the disciples. But the disciples here are the ones that are bringing about this accusation. And apparently they felt, do you know what? Jesus' time is too important for these little kids. Jesus, do you know who Jesus is? This is a man that's unstopping deaf ears. He's opening blinded eyes. This is the man that's walking on water. He is too busy to take time for these little children. And apparently they felt like that. And Jesus, in turn, he turned around and he rebuked them for their attitude regarding those kids. And he told those disciples in no uncertain terms that little children were what the kingdom of heaven was all about. Now, church, it is appropriate that Jesus should give this teaching about the little children just after he just got through speaking about marital relationships. 
the statement in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 15 where the Bible says, and they twain shall be one flesh. It literally is fulfilled when a married couple come together and produce a child. It fulfills the scripture. Now, let's face it. Children, unlike adults, cannot give to the work of the body of Christ. They, they're not giving no offering on Sunday morning, praise God. And, and, and if we're going to be able to keep their attention and keep their efforts, there is going to be a cause for special programs and other things in order to get them involved. But, and Jesus says in, in Psalm chapter 127, verse number three, David says, Low children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. We are blessed by all of the little ones that are around us. That lets us know that God is sending blessings. And this passage has something to say about children and by extension about the kingdom of God. Now, let's walk through this and we're going to bring out a few things that will help us in this endeavor to make sure because we're mindful of the fact that 30, 40 years from now, majority of the people that are here right now may not be here in the capacity that they are right now. So the little children are the ones that we are going to have to get ready to continue to do the work of the Lord. Somebody got to put the communion in the tray. Somebody got to be here to open the door. Somebody got to make sure that the water is red. Somebody got to teach Sunday school. Somebody got to continue to run the food bank. Somebody got to do this stuff. But if there's nobody left to do it, don't forget about the children and there are three lessons that I want to talk about on tonight that we have to give in order to make sure that there is somebody left around to continue the work of the Lord and that is number one teach them about service teach them about service teach them not to always want to be a receiver but to be a giver every now and then in your life this passage clearly reveals certain responsibilities that both the parent and the church have toward our children. Now, let me put this disclaimer out there. It's not the job of the church to make sure your children know Jesus. It's not the job of the Sunday school teacher to make sure your children know how to get to Matthew. It's not the job of the Sunday school teacher to preach to anybody. They only encourage them and build upon what should already be put in them before they even get to the house of God. So this passage nowhere um, implies that Jesus was saving these little children. That wasn't what he was doing. He was merely praying for them and pronouncing a blessing upon their young lives. And this teaches us that these parents cared enough, listen at this, not about the physical condition of their children, but they cared enough about the spiritual condition of their children to not leave them at home while they went out to see Jesus. But they say, you know what? Put your shoes on. Get your, get your jacket on because guess what? We're going out to see the Savior and I don't just want to get a blessing for me, but I want my children as well to be blessed. Now, from the earliest passages of the Bible, believers have been challenged to share the things of God with their children. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. You can go there and read. And then in the New Testament, it renews that challenge to parents in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. Now, parents should do everything in their power to make sure their children are exposed to God. Not just to God, but to make sure that your children are exposed to the gospel. This means bringing them to church. Not just on Christmas. Mother's Day and Easter. I didn't know we were CME Church of Christ. I just thought we were Church of Christ. Bringing them to church on a regular basis. So that they can become acquainted with the word of God. Bring them to Sunday school. It means praying for them and with them and opening the Bible with them. Not just here at church, but at home. It means being open, not just about the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, but being open and being real about the struggles that you've had in your own life. 
the struggles that you've had in your own walk with God, your children ought not think that you're Sister Mary Clarence. You know what? You're, they ought to look to you and think that, oh, mama is superwoman and daddy is superman. But you ought to be real enough with your kids to say, hey, life get tough every now and then. And, and you may not always be on the mountaintop. So don't get so used to being on top of the mountain that you don't know how to survive once you find yourself down in the valley. We serve our children by educating them about the word of God. We want to make sure that they get the best secular education that they can get, that they can go to the best college that they can, to get the best education that they can. Well, if you want them to have that knowledge, they ought to have the same amount of knowledge in the word of God. Because the, the Pythagor Pythagorean film don't help me when I'm going through my problems. I don't need to know MX plus B equals this and that. <laughs> when, I, when I'm going, it may help me on my job. But when I find myself dealing with spiritual warfare, I'm not trying to add X and B and M. I'm trying to get down on my knees and call on my father that is able to help me with what it is that I'm dealing with. So we are responsible for making sure that the young people around us know the gospel. We are responsible for that church. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, the word nurture is mentioned. What do we mean by nurture? It means the whole training and education of a child. It is not the public school teacher's responsibility to make sure your child knows Jesus. They ain't going to tell them nothing about Jesus. They'll tell them about evolution and all this other kind of stuff. And as I stated on Sunday, that's why we got to make sure that your children know who they are. They know whose they are. They know who made them. They ought to know that they are fearfully and wonderfully made in the eyesight of God. You were made by the great God of heaven. You didn't just poof out of nowhere. God made you. So we are responsible for bringing them up in the knowledge of God. So we can teach them lessons about service, making sure that they know it's not an option, it's your responsibility to serve God. Come on. Come on. Just like you, you, you don't miss a day of taking in air, you will not miss a day of giving God the praise that is so rightfully due to him. And let me tell you, you are never too young to know what it is that God is doing in your life. Yes, you, and when you mention, as you mention, you talk about Timothy and you talk about how from a young man that he knew the scriptures, how he knew the word of God. How did he know it? Did he just pick up a book one day and start reading and come to the knowledge that he had? No, he had a mother and he had a grandmother that were right there that were instilling the word of him because apparently and apparently because, you know, what, it could have been this reason because his daddy was mixed up in all kinds of Greek mythology and all this kind of stuff. So guess what? You might have to go be with your daddy for a weekend and I don't want you going over there with him for the weekend and come back being all mixed up in your mind so, so instead of you going over there we are going to put the word of God in you so that you will be able to stand no matter where you find yourself so that's why he was able to tell him let no man despise your youth but rather be thou an example be thou an example so we can teach them lessons about service and then number two salvation we can teach them about salvation church we can you know there are many ways and we thank god for all of the various ways and tools that we can use because you know what children don't understand the stuff that you understand that's why we have to meet them where they are you know it's good i can you know get up here and preach the gospel but when a child leaves out of here they may not understand anything that came out of my mouth so we have to make the gospel appeal to those that may not be able to understand 
And we have to start from a young age letting them know, hey, you are here right now. You, you may have a closet full of toys in there. You get this and you got that. But let me tell you, I know I may have went to the store and picked it up for you physically. But I want to let you know that there was a God somewhere that gave me what I needed to get you what you got. When you woke up this morning, you came down, you chose what you wanted to eat. I might have went and picked it up from the store, but there was a God somewhere that gave us the money so that we could have something to eat teach them how to give God glory for what it is that he has done in their life so while this scripture that we are reading certainly highlights every adult person's responsibility to the youth and to their children it also speaks to salvation what does it imply? The fact that children are invited to come to the Savior implies that children need a Savior. Not just adults need a Savior. Children need a Savior as well. Now, most folks don't like to hear this, but children can become sinners too. Children can become sinners too. When they get to it because everybody comes to a place in their life where they know, hey, I I'm doing this, but I already know that I shouldn't be doing it. But I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because I want to do it. But if they have not been trained and taught those things that are right and wrong, how can they even know if they do get caught up in sin? We are responsible for teaching them about Jesus Christ. Now, whenever a, a discussion uh, about childhood comes up and we're talking about salvation, somebody always want to come up with the age of accountability. The age of accountability. Now, when, when, when I was growing up, um, I understood it from what people say that the age of accountability was 12 because, oh, Jesus was 12 when they found him in the temple and he was in that preaching. He was 12 years old. Ain't nowhere in the Bible where it talk about no age of accountability. There are children that have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ at eight years old, seven years old and younger. They have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ because I don't care who you are. If you are in your right mind, if you hear that there was a man that loved you enough to give his life, didn't just give his life, but he got up on the third day so that you as well could get up out of your condition. I don't know nobody with good sense that would turn that down. So what is the age? It's different for everybody. There are some children that have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and you got people around here 40 and 50 still don't know Jesus. So you, it cannot be an age of accountability if there are seven and eight year olds around here walking that can tell you more about Jesus than somebody that's lived three and four times the, 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 the amount of years that they've lived. So a child becomes accountable for his or her sins when they come to a place where they understand the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 16 talks about this the term age of decision might be where the folk got age of accountability from. When a person reaches a level of understanding regarding the nature of the decisions that they are making. So when is that age? As I said, it's different for everybody. So we cannot say, well, hey, you ought to be at this place or you ought to be at this place because I was there. No, everybody gets there on their own time. And you cannot force Jesus on nobody because, because this is where a lot of people have made a mistake if they don't want to be honest about it. A lot of children didn't know why they were going up. They were told to go up. A lot of people came to, well, when they got baptized, they didn't know, they didn't even know they was going to do that. They, somebody just nudged them on the shoulder and said, hey, go up there. And, 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 and they are making a decision, but they really have no knowledge about what it is that they're doing. They just know, hey, I went up there and got in the pool. It was kind of cool. You know? That's all that they know. You ought to want them to make that decision for themselves. 
You do your job by teaching and instructing, but let them come to that realization for themselves. Jesus said, today that you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. He didn't say the day that you decide to tap them on the shoulder, let them come. Today that they hear the voice of God, let them come and make that decision for themselves. So we ought to be teaching them what they need to be, do to be saved. Not only what they need to do to be saved, but what they need to do to make sure that they don't lose their salvation. Don't have them thinking that just because they got baptized that they ain't got to do nothing else for the rest of their life. And they go all throughout life living how they want to do and what they want because they thought just because they were baptized they were on their way to heaven. But teaching them that the scripture says that he that endureth until the end shall be saved. Also, church, we can teach them lessons about the Savior. Lessons about Jesus Christ. So this passage not only speaks about service and salvation, it also says something about the Savior. Watching Jesus minister to these children, we get a glimpse of the Lord's personality. We can see the heart of Jesus when he's talking to these children. The disciples thought that Jesus was too busy for these little children. He's too busy for them. He got a tight schedule. He got people to see. He got things to do. He ain't got no time for them. When the Bible says they brought unto him, it has the idea of a long line of children being brought to Jesus. Parents, y'all, from all over the area had brought their children to Jesus so that he could pray for them. And when the disciples rebuked the parents, the Bible said that Jesus was much displeased. Jesus didn't like that. This means that Jesus got angry with the disciples for trying to stop the children from getting up to him. And, and children hold a special place in the heart of God. And Mark chapter 9 and verse 42 reminds us that harsh judgment that awaits those that abuse little children. And Jesus always defends those that are defenseless. He always stands up for them. So we can see the heart of Jesus. And, and it reminds us, church, that God is not interested in what we can do, what we can give, or how old we are. He simply invited people to come to him on the basis here of I'm Jesus. Where else are you going to get it from? And those parents had enough sense to know, hey, this is Jesus. And apparently some of their children could have been sick or had different things going on with them. And maybe they had had of heard about some of the other people that had issues and other things that they were dealing with. And hey, if Jesus was able to help them with what they were going through, maybe he can do something for my child. So if these people in those days had the mind that if there's something going on, even in my child's life, I need to bring them to Jesus. Don't you think we need to have that same mindset, church? Don't you think that we ought to have that same mentality? That we ought to be bringing them to Jesus? Some of them, they got too old for you to physically bring them. But I told you Sunday, some, you got, you, you, sometimes you can't physically bring them. Sometimes you just got to go down on your knees. So, some, you know, sometimes you can't physically bring them. You done brought them for 17, 18 years. Now they done got out of your house and they ain't coming no more. You know what? You may not be able to physically bring them, but you can get down on your knees and say, Lord, I did my part. I raised them up of how you know they ought to do. Now, Lord, I want you to work on them so that they'll be who they should be in God. We can see the love that Jesus had for them. Jesus said, you know what? Forbid not the little children. Suffer them not. Let them come. For such is the kingdom of heaven. You know what? We're going to have to become as humble as those little children, church. If we expect to make it in heaven. We are going to have to have those minds, those minds like children, pure, innocent. We're going to have to become like that church if we expect to make it into heaven. God shows us here. You know what? I got time for everybody. I don't just have time for, for the scribes. I don't just have time for the religious teachers. I don't just have time for people that can do something. I got time for the little children. You know what? Jesus thought enough 
to take time out of his day and out of his schedule to take time out for those children, to bless them, and to pray for them. Church, we got to take time out for the younger generation. We can't, we, can't, we can't write them off because of what they're caught up in right now. Guess what? We got to give them time. Praise God, he gave you time. Amen, somebody. Praise God, he gave you time. So guess what? We're going to have to give them time as well. Well, they just out there living their best life. You lived your best life as well. Now, you know, praise God, praise God. You lived your best life as well. You made choices that you're still feeling right now. That's why your back aching right now because you were shucking and jiving and grooving and backsliding, doing everything that you could do. Now you're doing, you got to send somebody to store to get you some liniment, some bengay. But we don't want to tell that part of the story. But telling that story would be the greatest blessing sometimes that you can give to your children. Having them to grow up knowing, you know what? It, it ain't always glitz and glamour. Sometimes you're going to struggle. Sometimes you're going to find yourself at your wit's end. Sometimes, no matter how faithful you are, you're going to get sick. Your body is going to have ailments. You're going to have pains. That's going to happen. It's called life. It's going to happen at some point. Somebody going to talk about you and you're going to talk about somebody. It's going to happen at some point in life. Teaching them that and letting them know, hey, you got to be on guard. You got to be watchful. And that's why some that, that, that we touched on, but I want to bring it up again. That's why it, it does good as a family to fast from time to time. It does good to say, you know what? We're not going to be locked in on our iPads all day. Let's talk to God. It does good. We're not going to watch TV all day. Let's, get, let's, let's pray. Let's talk to God. Let, let, let's look at his word as a family church. If, we, if, if you're desiring something from God, you know what? Simply put, Lord, I'm going to put this to the side. I'm going to cut this phone off. I'm going to turn this TV off. And for this 30 minutes, I didn't say hour, for these 30 minutes, Lord, this is your time. This is your time. Y'all come, come, come in the house. Let's sit down and let's pray. Let's talk to God because I don't know what we got to face tomorrow, but I know who is in control of tomorrow. I don't know who's going to be driving crazy out on the street tomorrow, but I know who's going to be in the car with me. I don't know what I got to face when I get on the job tomorrow, but I know who's going to be standing there with me. I don't know if somebody's going to come into the school and try to cause harm to the kid, but I know before they get there, I I've already asked God to be a head of protection around them. He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Praise God. He said, when I see it, I'll pass on over you. Praise God. And let me tell you, God got a way, church. You can be surrounded by all kind of folk and something going on. God got a way of singling you out and letting everybody know that one right there belong to me. That's, that's my child. I got my hands on them right there. And God will protect you. He'll keep his hands on you when you are submitted to his will. When your mind is stayed on Jesus, when you have made God number one in your life, forsaken all others, and you have made God number one in your life, church, you'll be blessed, as he say, in the city, in the field, and you're going out, and you're coming in, because you have put God first. Well, how have we ended up in the entanglement that we find ourselves now? Because God is no longer number one. There is no inference, inference on going to church. Going to Bible study. If there are extra programs and things that are scheduled, that there is no will or no push to get them involved. And if there is no involvement now, when they get older, there will be no involvement. 
if they're not doing anything now, what's going to make them want to do something later on? What's going what's gonna, to But if we give them the opportunity now, get them to love it now, get them to want to be involved now, even later on, years down the line, even after mom and dad are no longer here, guess what? They'll still be right here giving God praise. May, and, may even if they move from here, they'll still be somewhere in the Lord's church serving him and giving him praise because that's been the way that they were trained to do. Now, that don't mean they won't go crazy because you went crazy. Praise God. That don't mean that they won't find themselves backside up in a hog pen, that don't, eating the husk. That don't mean, because that's been everybody at a point in time in their life. But praise God, just like, and in that story, we are given a, a mirror image of God that no matter how far out you get, when you make up in your mind to come back, he's standing right there. And aren't you glad that God is not like us because we be sitting there with our arms folded. Well, you shouldn't have left. Don't be coming back. You done spent all your money. You ain't getting nothing else from me. I don't want nothing else to do. Get away from him. But God said, you know what? Even though you done went out there and got out of fifth, y'all go get the best robe. Go kill the fatty cat. Go get the best ring and put it on his head. Because my son that once was lost, praise God, he has now been found. That was you, church. You were lost, but you've been found. Amen. Some of us were blind at a point in time in our life. Praise God. Now we are able to see. How did that happen? Did that happen because God just gave you over and forgot about you? Did that happen because those that loved you, your mom and your grandma and your aunties and all of them, they just threw you to the side? No, no, no. It happened because somebody was praying. Somebody thought enough of you to say, Lord, don't condemn them in their present condition. But Lord, just spam. Give them a little while longer. Lord, help them to wake up. Help them to realize the decisions that they're making and the choices that they're making. Lord, don't kill them. Give them another opportunity. Because we be real with ourselves. If God would have killed some of us five, ten years ago. You ain't got to go back there five, ten minutes ago. <laughs> As a man thinketh in his heart. <laughs> so is he. If God would have did that. So if God is not so easy to give up on us. Don't give up on the young people, church. Don't give up. They may be in a fix right now. But just like God got you out of your fix, guess what? He can get them out of their fix. He can get them out, church. I didn't say you. I said he can get them out. He can bring them out. Because, you know, we just have a way about when we want somebody to do something, the way we just talk to you. you we, I want you to do this and you're going to do it because this is what you're supposed to do and this is how you're going to do it. Not realizing you're talking to a person that, uh, unbeknownst to you, has become an adult. Has grown up and now, as some may say, they smell in themselves, you know. They've gotten to that point. So now the decisions that they make are not based on what you think. They're making their own decisions. They're making their own choice. It's no that you no longer you may still be paying their car note, you might still be chipping in on the rent, but guess what? <laughs> when it comes to stuff like that, they're making their own decisions. They're making their own choices. The only thing you can do is give advice. You can mentor. You can be there to give advice and guidance when asked in their time of need. But what you don't want to do is continue to how and how and how. And you may be doing it out of love, but to them, you're getting on my nerves. I don't want to hear it right now. Mama, I love you, but I ain't trying to go there today. I really don't try to hear. Well, Mama, I love you. I, I got to go. Somebody else call. I'll call you late. Let me tell you. And this don't just go with children. This go with anybody. Let me tell you. Sometimes you got to get to a point. You got to let some folk go, church. You got to get to a point to where you say, well, you know what? I love you enough to let you make your mistakes. I love you enough 
to let you be grown. I love you enough to make your own mistake. And when you fall, I'm going to love you enough to be right there to pick you back up. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to talk about you. I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to be, well, I told you so. I told you I'm going to be right there to pick you up because somebody had to pick me up one day. Somebody, even God, was long-suffering with me, patient with me. I'm glad. I don't know about y'all, but if you can't thank God for anything, yeah, just thank God for being long-suffering. Thank God for being patient with you. When he could have made his decision a long time ago, he said, you know what, just cut your ass off, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a bad, that's a bad, that's a bad man. He ain't even got to flip a switch. He can just think and just, <coughs> <laughs> just cut your ass off. A man with that kind of power, a man with that kind of reverence, we ought to make sure that those that we have influence over know something about him. Amen. That not just know something about him, but that they, as Paul said, know him. Yes. That they know the sacrifice that he made for them. And, and, and even, and let me, they may not to the level, of course, they're not going to know all the historicities of the Judaistic teachings. They're not going to know all of that. <laughs> Preaching what you said, yeah. But, you know, they're not going to know all of that. But they ought to know about Jesus. They ought to know about what he did for them. They ought to know what it is that even at their age, what it is that God requires of them. Being respectful. Telling the truth at all times. Don't put your hands to take nothing that don't belong to you. Those little things, same things that we need to be telling ourselves. <laughs> you know, because they might get a piece of bubble gum, but we put the wrong number on the tax sheet. That's for a different day. That, that's for next year, family. That's, that's for family week next year. We'll get on that. <laughs> we'll get on that another time. But it principles and things that we're supposed to be living by. We ought to be passing that down. And here it is. The greatest sermon that you're going to preach to your kids is not going to come out your mouth. It's going to be what they live. You know, children will tell you about yourself if you're not careful. You know, because, you know, sometimes they just unfiltered. They don't know any better, you know. They tell you about yourself. They tell you about yourself. I can remember even when we were little children, and my grandma, I know you're watching, hey, but uh, she was, uh, like she, I, I remember she had told, it was somebody, I think it was somebody trying to sell something at the front door. And um, we were young, I think me and my, the one that's next to me, it, we were the only ones around at the time, so we were real young. And um, the person came to the door, she's like, tell her I ain't here. And I went to the door and said, she said she ain't here. <laughs> that's what she said? <laughs> was I wrong? <laughs> She told me to tell you that she wasn't here. That could have been before she left or she could still be in her. But she told me to tell you that she ain't here. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. I still remember it. Still remember it. But here's the thing. You got to be careful. Because let me tell you, some things that you may do and you think that it's, oh, it's just then water under the bridge. It may be something that they pick up. And, and even if it don't play out right then, years down the road, church, it may be something that comes up. Because everything that happens don't come up overnight. Some stuff, it takes people a long time to process. So that's why, church, we got to make sure that they know God. And how are they going to know that? By the example that we give. They're going to want to go to church because you went. You made it a prayer. You didn't get up and look out the door and see it was finna rain and say, y'all get back in the bed. We ain't going today. You didn't say, well, I had a long night. I still got a headache from last night, so we ain't going today. You didn't do that. So they're not going to do it. You have been an example. We, we 
can talk all day of how, how big of Christians we are. Everybody got a lip and they can use them, you know. I've been in the church for this amount of years. I've been in there and I've been in that. But they'll see the example that you are setting. I see. I see somebody uh, was uh, had made a post. And it was like, I, I really wish that the the people down there at the church really, uh, they, you know, really knew how my auntie do. They were, you know, making a joke out of it, whatever. But they had put a video of their actual aunt, like on social media, and the words that were coming out of her mouth, you know, weren't becoming of a lady that does all the stuff that she did in church. So she was like, you know, he was like, I just really w wish wish y'all knew the real sister so and so and how she act and all this kind of stuff, you know, and you know. We all know brother and sister so and so, but there's uh, somebody else for everybody. Is the same person that we know the same person that everybody else know? Is the example that we give at 7009 the same example that we give at our home? Wherever we go, are we lifting up Jesus? Are we striving to serve him? Are we putting him first? Are we testifying to other individuals about what it is that God has done in our life, assuring them that he's able to do the same in their church? We all have an unseen audience. And the very time you may not think somebody's not paying attention or watching, somebody's watching. And you know what? It could, could be even just a little child could be watching. A, a little child could be watching and paying attention to the things that you are doing. And they could be saying, well, well, she's doing it. That must be how I'm supposed to live my life for Jesus. Well, he said it. He was over there. So, so I must be able to do that because they were able to do it. Make sure that we don't just talk Jesus, but you're living. Anybody can talk about Jesus, but when the rubber hits the road, are you setting the example that we are supposed to set. Jesus said that you will know them. Not by what come out of their mouth. But by the fruit. I, like I, what I said the other week. Every tree look like a tree until some fruit come out. Man man. I'm, I'm waiting on them oranges to come in. Before you know it you got apples coming out. Everything look the same. Until the fruit comes forward church. Is there any fruit in your life. Of this supposed Christianity that you claim since you have come to know Jesus is there any change in your life since you have become a Christian and your name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life is there any difference in that you and the you now if there is not there's some work that needs to be done there's always work that needs to be done why is that because none of us in here are perfect and that's why every single day of our lives, not work on other people, work on you. Amen. Work on you, church. We got enough issues, malfunctions, and dysfunctions that we need to be working on. And guess what? All of that stuff that I got going on is going to take up so much time, I ain't going to have enough time to worry about you. If I really focus on me like I need to focus on me, I wouldn't even know you were sitting over there because I was too busy. I was too busy worried about me. In closing, there was a lady that had came to a preacher and she told him, she said, you know what? I'm just tired of y'all over here. Y'all just hypocritical and all this stuff that y'all doing. Everybody doing it. I just don't want to be anymore. I'm leaving. The preacher said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, um, but I want you to do something for me before you leave. And he gave her a, a, a full up glass of water. He gave it to her. He said, I want you to go out there and I want you to walk around the church and I want you to come back. And I want you to bring that, that cup back to me, but I don't want you to drop a single drop of water out of that cup. She did it. And she came back and, and she, brought, she said, well, I didn't drop anything out of it. He said, well, well did you see so-and-so? She said, no. Well, did you see so-and-so? She said, no, I was too busy trying to keep the water in the cup. If you spend your time on you, working on you, trying to get you together, trying to make sure that you are, are where God desires for you to be, you will not have time to be having your mind caught up on all of this other stuff that draws you away from where you need to be, church. We need to bring our focus back to the home. 
We cannot at all solve the issues that are arising in the body of Christ until we solve the issues in our own home. I cannot be an asset to the church if I'm not an asset in my home. It's not possible. It's not possible for me to serve God with my all if I'm not giving my all at home. I cannot possibly uh, teach the young women and, uh, and teach the young men this and that if I haven't, first of all, been a teacher at home. That's where it starts, church. It starts in the home. From a young age. Don't wait till they get 16 and want to tell them about Jesus. Don't wait till they get old and say, hey, we going to church. We ain't been going to church. Why are we going now? <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's make sure right now that they have a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if not, they'll grow up thinking somebody owed them something. Amen. Thinking that where they got, they got there by themselves. Yeah. And because of what they did, they'll wake up every morning. Oh, huh, look at what I did. I woke myself up. Not realizing that if it had not been for God just touching them that morning with his finger of love, they would not have even got up out of the very bed. And why is there another reason for us to do this? Because the leaning tree ain't always the first one to fall. Right. Amen. Just as many young people die as old yes. people. Yes. They don't have to be sick. Yes. Car accidents. Yes. Crazy people shooting up places. Yes. All kinds of things are going on, church. Yes. Children aren't even assured that they are going to get to the point where they can graduate high school. And in certain cities, you go to Detroit, Chicago, and places like that, your life expectancy is taken down a few years, even as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the environment that you're in. Same stuff going on over there, going on here as well, just on a smaller scale. Yeah. That's why they ought to have a relationship with God. Yeah. And they ought to know him. Because even as a teenager, it's possible, God forbid, to lose your life. And at that age, you have a knowledge of what you're doing, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. So shouldn't you want to make sure that they have that relationship with God? So God forbid, if a time like that should come, you won't be up there crying. You are, even though you'll be sad, you won't weep for their soul. Because you will know assuredly that you raised them up like they were supposed to. They had the knowledge that they were supposed to have. They lived the life that they were supposed to live. So you know one day if you live faithful, guess what? You'll get to see them again. Let's work on the home church. From the children to the spouse to the we to the spouse. We need to work on it. Because Satan is working on it. He's doing everything that he can. To destroy the makeup of the home. He's doing everything that he can. To totally just reshape and redesign the home. As God has designed the church. That's why we got to make sure that we instill the word of God. We got to make Jesus. Not, not just a, a Sunday. A Sunday talk about. Make him a daily conversation. Amen. In your home. Make time with God a priority. Let's talk with him. Let's pray. So that we can develop those relationships that we need. So God forbid if those times come. They can have something they can lean on. They have something that they can rest on. What can they rest on? That I have given my life to Jesus Christ. I have obeyed the gospel. My name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life. And guess what now? I'm marching on up the King's Highway. Amen. I'm striving. That's what we all do in church. We're striving. And just like you that's been in the church 20, 30 years striving, the young people got to be striving. He said, to remember the creator in your old age. In the days of your youth. While you're young, remember your creator. Create a love for your creator. So when the years go by and times go by and as things happen, you always remember those things that you were taught and those things that you were instilled in. And guess what? When you have kids, you will pass that on down to them. Because that was tough. You, you may not have liked being taken to church every day, but guess what? It kept you out of jail. 
It kept you from getting caught up in something that you should not have got caught up in. It taught you values. It taught you how to have certain morals and things in your life. You know, and as a child, I don't know about y'all, I was more excited about hanging out with my church friends than my friends that I had at school. Because of the relationship that we had. The times that we had together. We ought to want those same things for the generations that ought to come. Because what is happening is that there is going to come a generation of people that know not God. There's going to come a generation of people, church. If we don't start yesterday, because today is too late. If we don't start yesterday, we don't start right now, church, it's going to be too late. Because there's going to be no desire to serve God. No desire to go to church. No desire to do that. No desire to do that. So, so how is the work of the Lord going to continue to go forward if there is no desire? You know Southwestern Christian College right now can't even get five guys to come out there to go to their school of preaching. Can't even get five students to come and enroll to go to their school of preaching. So ministry, students, students seeking degrees in ministry all over is going way down. So, 20, 30 years from now, who's going to fill in the pulpits? Who's going to evangelize? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? If nobody has the desire to do the work of God. We got to start right now, church. Got to start right now. Tomorrow we're going to be too late. We got to start right now. Making sure that we pass this knowledge. Make sure that we pass these desires, these zeals for God so that years from now, the work of the Lord will still be going on as it should. Let's not forget the children. And the greatest misfortune that was ever told was that children were the church of tomorrow. They're the church of right now. Come on, man. We don't know what tomorrow we're going to hold. They are the church of right now. And we cannot wait till tomorrow to encourage them. We got to encourage them right now. So that they'll be able to stand against the various trials of this life. My brother and my sister, our homes are under attack. Our marriages are under attack. Relationships with spouses and children, children and parents, they are under attack. So that's why we got to work on them. We got to bring God back into every facet of our home life. So that our homes can be as God has desired for them to be. You ought to go back home tonight and say, devil, I don't know where you're in here. I don't know if you're in the bathroom, the kitchen, wherever you're at. But you got to get up out of here. You've been here long enough. You got to go. There's not going to be tension between me and my spouse. Me and my children are not going to argue. We are going to have love between each other. I don't care what kind of seeds you've been planting in here. I ain't going to water going to get on them. They're going to die right where they're at. You've been evicted. You got two minutes to get out of here. Usually they give you 30 days. You got two minutes to get out of here. Make sure that the Lord is welcome in your home. That you create a space for God. And guess what? You can be even in your own home. Talking whether you're praying or whatever. And can I tell you what? You're not there by yourself. Because he said, well, two or three are gathered together in my name. Guess what? I'm right there in the midst of you. So, can I tell you, you don't even have to do it by yourself, but that through your teaching and your trying to raise them how you're supposed to, that God will be right there every step of the way to help you to do what it is that you need to do. So my brothers and my sisters, maybe you're here on tonight, or maybe you're watching us, and you stand in need of prayer on tonight for your family. You, you want to ask for prayer? Let me tell you, we, we got to stop coming and leaving without getting the prayer that we need. Amen. Because the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, they truly avail as much. And if we be honest, all of us right now need somebody to pray for us. Amen. We stand in the need of prayer because we got issues in every aspect of our life that we are dealing with. But when it comes to the home, that's where the issue is. A pound it. They're, 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 they're insurmountable. They're just piling on top of each other. Yeah. And that's why we need God to intervene and to help us with this stuff. Yeah. So if you stand in need of prayer on the night for your family, 
for your relationships. You have that opportunity to request prayer on tonight. Uh, maybe you're here at this moment or maybe you're watching us and you're not a member of the Lord's church. You have that opportunity to accept the Savior's invitation at this time. You come by hearing the word of God, believing what it is that you've heard. Repent of your sins and confess Christ as your Savior. Be buried with him in baptism and the Lord himself will add you to his body. And after that, you remain faithful unto death. And guess what? One day you receive a crown of life that will never fade away. So my brother and my sister, we're bringing God back into our home. We're bringing God back into our family. If you stand in need of prayer or you're subject to the invitation at this time, don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. You can come now. It's together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Just as I am without one need, my